fate of the universe on the line. I want Iguadala. I'm Kevin Durant. You know who I am. Curry, way down to Ime went too far, got caught and stuck in tar. Suns looking for a new owner. Till now, it's only been a blur. Season looking closer, we've navigated the off-season away, near and far, forever together. It's a hashtag Wallace Bay, NBA podcast, your favorite NBA podcast in an Indian accent. We are back at it again with episode 6 of season 6. And if you haven't already, I urge you to hit that subscribe, follow, like button, because we do an episode every week of the season. In the association this week, Head coach Ime Udoka found the saying, once a spur, always a spur come to life. Kawhi Leonard gave new meaning to the term, got legs. And if you've been saving up some money, there's an NBA team for sale. Speaking of investments, I've got with me, as always, someone with a huge investment in time and even more in people. Someone who stays away from hedge fund bros and someone who has never seen in a vest. My co-host, Vinny Devaya. That's a good introduction, man. That's a good introduction. But we have a guest today, my friend. Do you have an introduction we have a guest, guest? Of course, we have a guest today. I mean, I, I'm going to cover up the guest so that it's surprising for people. But oh, it's a surprise. Okay. okay our, guest, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> our guest tonight is journalist, writer, editor, film critic Pete Croato, whose latest book from hang time to prime time, business, entertainment, and the birth of the modern day NBA is now out in bookstores, online and otherwise. So go grab a copy. Pete, thanks so much for spending the time to talk with us today. My Welcome pleasure. To My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I got the name right, right? Co-op. Yeah, yeah. Is Actually, you know what? It's it's a yeah. I you you did. I mean, that's um, I, I've had my I've had. Yeah, but you know what? The thing is, I've had my name butchered in so many ways okay. and so many inventive ways. I'm used to it now. So um, so yeah. It, it's 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 always a pleasant surprise when someone gets. Where, the where's name the right. where's the origin of the name from? Like that. You know what? I, that's a really great question, and I don't. No one's ever. It's funny. Few people ask me that, but it's. It's from Croatia. I have ancestors who, nice. were, who were from, who were who you know origin. That's that's where the root comes from. And somewhere along the line, you know, my ancestors, you know, I have ancestors from Italy. You know, it's yeah. So the name kind of you know has a funky journey. So Croato is yeah. Croatia is the root of it. Have you have you been there? Do you know if you have relatives there or is just? I don't know about anyone in Croatia. I I, I know for a fact I have relatives in Ar- in Argentina. Um, okay. And I may have I may have relatives in um, in Italy, uh, where my grandfather was born. He was born in a small village up north called Udine. Uh, so I may have relatives there, but I, I don't I don't know about Croatia. Maybe um, I know that there is a a long time ago. Uh, I found out that there was a Paul Croato in Australia. So maybe he's maybe he knows where the where the croatian relatives where the, are but i don't where the so. croatos are coming from that's fine <laughs> pete, pete uh, we will talk about your book in a while but can you you know just for our uh, listeners tell us you know how your nba journey started how uh, like are Knicks your favorite team why why not yeah. or, wait Knicks are your favorite team pete? no 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 well they oh. are my favorite team as, <laughs> as a, like... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I. You know, it's funny. I was a Knicks fan for a long time, and then James Dolan just worked my last nerve, and I, I thought, you know, I am just, I, I am, I am ups- I'm miserable all the time. I do not like how this, per- how this, how this man has destroyed a once proud franchise. I'm out, and it was him. It was a team uh, not re-signing Jeremy Lin. That made me. Oh, that was yeah. the last straw. I was like, I'm done. I, I yeah. when you, when you when you sign the likes of Jerome James and Steve Francis and um, you know other uh, disintegrating pieces of NBA detritus, detritus, and you don't resign the man who galvanized your fan base for you know a good you know two months. Two months. I, yeah. I was done. <laughs> so I was done. But yeah, but the Knicks were my entry, were, were sort of my were, were the first team basketball team that I loved, and that was the the early the, the early '90s Knicks teams of of Patrick Ewing and John Starks and Charles Oakley, which have been chronicled in, in two really good books um, that have just come out. But yeah, that was how you know that's how I got into the NBA. Was I think it was probably like a lot of kids my age. I'm 45. I got into the NBA in the early '90s. So Jordan, Michael Jordan, I think was my was my entry point. Because he was he okay. was everywhere um, in the U.S., of course, even New York, and then 
you know, and then I got into the Knicks because they were my they were the local team. Um, the Nets were never any fun to root for because they were always losing. <laughs> um, you know, they were they were in New Jersey back then, but the Knicks were just the team that I gravitated toward because they were the they were the they had you know Patrick Ewing was a big star and they Pat Riley was coaching. So for for fourteen for a fourteen year old me, it was it was a perfect a perfect team to start uh, following basketball with, and I haven't really looked back. Wow. Okay. And so, so which team are you rooting for these days? Are you teamless? I might. You know what it is? I've 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 told people this, and I'll tell you guys the same thing. I, I'm pretty much a, an NBA, just an NBA fan. Oh. Uh, you know. I, well, I mean, look. I I you know. <laughs> I, I I mean, I have I have a soft spot spot for the Sixers because I lived for a little bit um, in the Philadelphia area, and I was with I I fall I was watching that team when they were in the midst of the process, like when the process was just starting and you had, you know, um, neurons are well and, and like ish Smith started getting yeah. prime time minutes. So like that's, so I, so I, I was watching them when I was, before I was really before, you know, I was even sniffing a book. Um, mm-hmm. but now, you know, now I just, I, I just, I gravitate toward players, you know, Giannis and Luca and, um, you know, I love Joel Embiid. I think he's, he's phenomenal. So it's, so I don't really have a team as much anymore. And I think mm-hmm. for me, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but like as I get older, like it's, and you know, I have a, fa- I have a daughter, I'm married, you know, I have a mortgage and a job. Like I, 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 I don't have the energy to invest in like following a team, following one team from, from game one to the postseason. It's just it's a lot of work. So I I am a fan of just turning on a game and watching it, or even mm. even enjoying a good broadcast crew. Like the Nets uh, have a really good broadcast crew with um, Ian Eagle and uh, Sarah Kustak. So yeah, I, I, as I've gotten older, I, I my my pleasures are simpler, but they're I don't think they're as but I think they're I think I get just as much out of them. If that makes so, so when did this when did this happen when you went from New York Knicks oh, to now NBA is my team? That's a really good question. Um, I think it was probably around 2012, 2013 when I, st- okay. you know, I, and I don't know, I don't know what it was. I just to me, I just felt I felt like you know what I enjoy just different. I enjoy watching different teams. Like I enjoy watching the Celtics play or the Bucks play, and you know, I also I, I do, there are certain players that I enjoy playing. So why should I? I think the logic was why should I invest myself so much in one team where mm-hmm. I'm going to not appreciate other players, other teams. And and this and and I was a victim of this when I was following the Knicks because as you guys well know, the Knicks nemesis for years and years and years is Michael Jordan. So mm, yep. I spent a, hel- a healthy part of my teens hating, hating Michael, Jordan. Michael Jordan and and just and and ruining his presence. When mm-hmm. honestly, I missed out on so much of his greatness because I was so obsessed with hating the man. So now I can watch a Golden State Warriors Bucks game, watch Steph Curry, watch Giannis Antetokounmpo, and enjoy both of their enjoy both of what they bring to the table, and I'm happier for it. So I think it's just maybe it's a maybe it's a maybe it's a, a byproduct of getting older and wiser. Yeah, older maybe. I, I don't just, know. Just I mean, older, I guess. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I mean, it's it's just yeah. I, I've, I, I mean, I don't know. I, there, I, I maybe now that I've written this book and I I, I write a lot of NBA stuff, I, I don't want to seem like I'm too tied into one team. Yeah, that makes because sense. I I because I don't, I don't want to you know go go into an interview with somebody or interact on social media and have them accuse me of being yeah. you know a a Grizzlies fan. Or a, a, yeah, exactly. So it's just. It's just easier. I mean, I, I think it's just easier for me professionally, and it's it's a hell of a lot easier for me emotionally. Uh, Pete, I mean, you obviously, no, there's no point telling you this, but the, the NBA is you know so huge all over the world that there are fans uh, across the world, right? And right. like, I, I was a Oklahoma City Thunder fan from 20, 2010 to uh, like when Westbrook left. Like that was the yeah him left my fanhood and then I was like okay I just love Westbrook wherever he goes I'll follow him uh, Vinny's on the other hand Spurs fan I don't I'm not sure if he's ever been to San Antonio but he, no, no. But even without that he's he's connected with them at some level about uh, professional excellence I mean the what is it called the team excellence and how yeah. they 
uh, rate some things better than the other and they have this low attitude and all that which he finds with so uh, have you heard any crazy stories about all these fan groups that exist in places where they, there's no geographical connection to them like Knicks fans in India we have Knicks fans in India never pretty sure none of them have ever been to New York a lot of them yeah so no I mean there there's so, there's actually I did a podcast with uh, with with the with the gentleman about a year or so ago who's based in London and, mm-hmm. and he is a he is a die hard Knicks fan, like okay. like full blood, like watches every game, just into it. And I think that's the remar- that's to me is the remarkable um, what's so remarkable about the NBA is that mm-hmm. it it is it not only is it a, is it a worldwide property, but you can really root for any team or any player and you don't really get gut for it. Like it's, you know, I, I think that's, and that's the beauty of how the NBA is marketed individuals and is also just made the games available everywhere. Like with league, like yeah. with NBA league pass or the, or even just using Twitter and social media really well, you can be, you know, you can be, you know, you can root for a team anywhere and it's not deemed unusual. Like, Oh, you don't mm-hmm. like that team or you don't like that player. And you know, the roots of, it's not it's it's the roots of that are from well in the 80s when the nba started marketing you know players o- over teams um but yeah i don't know I mean, i'm just curious like where you guys are are there pockets of fans like are i mean are, i mean i'm trying to think it'll be really interesting to see what happens if there is a, if there's a player from india who mm-hmm. makes who makes waves in the nba i think that's that's the big thing is i think you see pockets of fans from where where the where the where the where the player where there's a player in the NBA, like yeah. you know, like Lafayette like or Spain Giannis, or whatever. Giannis and Greece. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think that I think that's that's what I've I've noticed and heard about. But um, but yeah, the, that's a, the beauty of this game is of the NBA is just the fact that you can be pretty much be a man without a, a person without a country and root for, root for whomever you want, yeah. and I, I don't think you'll get gut for it. In, in India, I mean, we, Vineet and I have uh, like talked about the length. In India, Steph Curry is all the craze. Like, uh, we see him as someone that you know, like he's only six foot three, right? And he does something which we we can sort of imagine doing if we practice really hard and shoot yep. thousand threes a day for three years in a row. We could get as good as him. But like a LeBron James, we, we are never going to be six foot eight, moving like him. We're never <laughs> going to be a Giannis. We are never going to be. But yeah. But Luca has a lot of fan, uh, big fan base in India. Steph has a huge fan base. Like without doubt, I think Steph has the biggest fan base. Then Kobe Bryant. Uh, of course, it goes down when the generations. I think people who started watching 2014, 15, when the Warriors started doing their thing, uh, they are hardcore Warriors fans. They've been waiting for this day ever, ever since every they they lost in that uh, Toronto series, and people were like, "Oh no, that's it. You're done." And then next day, next year, everyone was injured. They could do anything. And then they come back to this season, uh, win the chip. And so you can see that celebration. Like everybody just wants to shoot threes, right? In India, all we want to do is shoot threes. You go to uh, local uh, small tournaments with little, like under 18, under under yeah. 17, under 15. All of them just want to shoot threes. They want to be like Steph because that's that's what they think that, you know, oh my God, three greater than two. Three is much mm. easier to shoot also than the mid-range <laughs> and all that. That's the way that they think. So I mean, that's fascinating. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, no. And because I mean, of Steph, he, the Warriors fans. Yeah, no. That that makes that makes perfect sense. I think he I think he is sort of an international avatar, because as you mm-hmm. said, he's relatable, and <laughs> I think that's that's what I think gets a lot of that's that's the entry point for a lot of people is oh I can do what he does or what she does. Um, I mean, and LeBron also. I mean, LeBron's been around for almost twenty years now, so I think there might be a little bit of that old. That that yeah. familiarity, um, where oh, like he's we, yeah. There are, there are a lot of before. LeBron fans in India too. So it's not oh, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, tons, yeah. tons. Yeah, but with Steph, but Steph, I mean, it's 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 so fascinating how I think, you, and you're right, uh, Ashwin. I mean, I've seen that too, playing pickup ball. Like nobody is going, no one's posting up anymore. Everyone mm-hmm. is taking a step back and shooting the three and. The, the cool thing about Steph Curry, which is, I think, a blessing and a curse, is that I think he turned the, the three-point shot into an approachable shot. Meaning, back in the old days, like the three-point shooter would just be someone who would stand behind the three-point line with their arms open, get the, the, they'd be past the ball, or you know they would cut and the ball would come to them, like a Reggie Miller. 
now Steph Curry is shooting three pointers the way that someone like Kawhi Leonard would shoot a mid range would shoot a mid range jumper, crossing right. somebody mm-hmm. up, you know, spinning and then shooting shooting and he's shooting from distances that are just absurd. I mean, they, these are not distances that are that if you were coaching somebody, it's, yeah, they're 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 insane. So, so yeah, I mean, he he is Steph Curry is, and what and what's so. Um, what's so um, insightful is t- talking to you guys is that not only has he affected, you know, I think the way the way the basketball is played in America, but it's in, it's international, and but that yeah. and that's but that's but I think that's always been the case. I think the international game has always been more of a stretch game, more of a yes. long distance game. But but he, I think he is he is really taking that to a whole other level, which is you know why. You know, which again is, is I, I think just show, shows you just how um, how much we how much the little man, um, figuratively and literally, um, has pull, how, how much pull that, per, that that the little man has. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Pete, uh, a, a a personal question about kind of your favorite uh, sort of I don't know beat writers or sport writers mm-hmm. that probably cover NBA. Uh, who do you like follow? Who do you like? Uh, who, who's been your inspiration? Yeah, you know what? Like, I'll I'll be honest with you. Um, I think you know, for me, Bill Simmons was a huge influence on me. Um, and I know that that's a, pr- a pretty cliche answer because you know, he's the, he's, he's for he's everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, it is like it was it was. I remember I was I was you know kind of in a. Uh, I started reading him like in when he was with ESPN in page two. And I remember just being in love with his writing style and the way that he looked yeah. at things and, you know, and, and that was really someone who, who really influenced me a lot. I mean, I don't really, fo- in terms of beat writers, I don't really follow so much, but authors, um, you know, beat writers or beat writers who wrote books like yeah, Harvey yeah. Arrington, Jack McCollum, Jackie McMullen, like they've all written like amazing, insightful books. Um, that really complemented their writing and expanded on their writing, and though the, that's who I, those are the people I thought I, I really, you know, I really kind of um, flocked to. Um, you know, the people that didn't write about basketball in a way that was just here's who scored, here's who did this. Um, you know, Terry Pluto, who wrote terrific oral histories on the ABA and 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 the old NBA, he was he was another influence. Just people that were just writers that were able to bring. Who are able to report basketball more, as more than just a game? And I think that's that's a sign of any good writer, um, sports writer, or any writer is they they look at they they don't look at their beat as just a beat as in terms of the who, what, when, where. They 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 look at the the ripples. They 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 do more than just they do they do more than just reporting a game. And mm-hmm. to me, the best right the best sports writers, whether they're um, the best sports writers. And the best sports authors, the best sports books, they're not just about sports. They're, they're about issues that are reflected in the sport. So those are the folks that I gravitate to. I gravitated to then and now. You know, I'm always I'm always on the lookout for writers that are are, are doing things beyond just the normal. Like Marion Fader does that a lot. Um, Aaron Weitzman at Fox Sports is always writing about things that are that are not just about, you know, what happened on the court. So that's that's still what I gravitate toward. Peter, uh, you know, like for this past, I think, two, three days, uh, all talk has been about Ime Udoka and his uh, troubles yeah. in the organization. Uh, one thing that sort of like me and Vinita talking about a little bit disturbing is that before an official word came out, there was already Woj bombs and Shams bombs dropping all over the yeah. court. Uh, and... Like, like we know that we live in a world where se- without sensationalism, nobody really gives a crap about what you are writing about. You can't write somebody scored 26 points. You have to be like, oh, he destroyed that other team's morale and jumped on them and dunked on them. And then he scored 26 points. And that's when yeah. people are like, oh, whoa, whoa, that's pretty nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. W- w- what are your feelings about this? I mean, you have obviously covered, not covered the game, but your book <laughs> sort of talks about, I'm guessing, prime time to, you know, hang time. Uh, it's covering ages, right? And yeah. just as basketball has evolved, I'm sure basketball coverage has also evolved. Oh God, uh, huge! I mean, it's ab- I mean, it's absolutely different now. I mean, it, from a from a couple of standpoints, and then I'll get to the um, to the whole Celtics embroglio. Um, yeah, I mean, r- the NBA 
what their genius was was that they were they were a marketing oriented league, but they were also a very press friendly league. So mm-hmm. if you look at if you look at NBA coverage back in the day in the eighties, even to the early nineties. A reporter could talk to Eddie. Uh, just, just, uh, just excuse yeah, me, second, but uh, you, you've been you, uh, the book covers the journey from 1980s to present, or like, can you give a little bit of? The, yeah, uh, the book uh, the book covers the NBA's rise as a business and entertainment property from the years 1975 to 1989, and the book also covers the role of the press. Um, okay. And the press at that time was it was the NBA. The NBA was a very very press friendly league because they had to be. Because newspapers yeah. and local television were the outlets. That's how you mm-hmm. got. That's how you got the message out. That's how a league was able to properly market its players and what it was doing. So yeah. So if if you're a, a, so if you're a reporter from you know from Oregon or from you know Chicago or Florida and you wanted to talk to David Stern, like you could talk to David Stern. If you if you if there was an issue that you had to get reported. You know Terry Lyons and Brian McIntyre, the the NBA's PR guys, they were on top of it. They would help you out because that was that was because the the league understood that the media had to be a partner with it. Um, that's totally changed now, not just in the NBA but with all sports, yeah. with with social media platforms, with the fact the fact that now every major sport, especially the NBA, has a major television contract. They have major exposure. The media's presence isn't isn't as re- isn't required. There is no and and really there is no incentive for a, for an NBA superstar to talk on the record with with a beat reporter or, or or with any reporter really because they can control the message. Steph Curry can reach you know countless millions on his Twitter account, on Instagram, any and also on any number of social media platforms that I don't even know about because it's moving so quickly. So the NBA, the NBA, so the NBA, I think what the NBA has become now, and you see this in the whole woes, shams dynamic, is that mm-hmm. it's really become, it's become less about, about covering teams and what the league is doing, but it's become all, it's become about and being quick and get, yeah. and getting, and getting trades out, getting, getting these, getting, okay, well, here's what's happening. Like here's, you know, here's, we got this trade move. We let's, I'm, we're going to report it because I think the access is probably easier now to get to agents and to players inner inner circles than it is to yeah. teams and the league itself. Um, mm-hmm. There, it's it's there it's 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 a the NBA is such a colossal business that there is no there is very little incentive for the NBA to be talking to reporters or to um, or, or to fo- or to folks um, about like what's going on. So the I think podcasters. Yeah, no. exactly. Podcast, especially podcasters. So, but what's happened? But I think now this what's happened. The the role of the NBA now, or with the me- media now, is to is to, not really to it's not really to not really to focus so much on nuance and team results and, we'll, and and player profiles. But I think it's more about trades and like okay, well, this is what's happening now because. It's just it's. I think it's easier to report. It's also what gets Twitter and Instagram and Facebook all on a twi- all yep. on a tizzy. The problem is, the problem that I see, and again, this is this is somebody who's an NBA fan and somebody who dabbles in the media, is that you cannot apply that 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 uh, you know uh, Gallinari you know signed with the Celtics. You can't apply that that fantasy basketball mindset that, oh, here's who we signed mindset to a super complicated mm. news story mm. like what's happening in Boston because there are too many variables. There are too many facts. You need to report that out. You can't just, you know, this race to first is fun and exciting when it's about who won the MVP or Oh, who you know? Who uh, you know? Who got traded? Or who signed with this team? It is less fun in games when it involves the situation. That's what, that's that's what's happening. That's that's happening in Boston. Um, yeah. uh, w- you know, with 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 the, with the coach there. It's 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 you can't be so quick to judge. You can't be so quick to report on a super complicated topic like that. It's and you're seeing the side effect of that, and. But the problem is now is that we're now it's now a race to first, 
And mm-hmm. that's what it is with all media now. It's just we have to get this out first. And context and reporting, it's important, but it's not that important. It's not as important as getting, getting, the, getting the news out first. And unfortunately, when you have when you have a complicated situation like this, it, it's not so clean cut. You just you just can't you just you just can't say, oh yeah, you know, Amy Doak was getting fired. You just can't you just can't leave it at that and expect people yeah, to move exactly. on. Yeah, exactly. So, you have to say you have to leave some time chat there, and then people pick up on that. I think there were talks about uh, like I, I think consensual was trending on Twitter immediately after they said that it was an intimate and consensual and and. Like I, I'm sure a lot of uh, Boston staff, female staffers, were pro- like probably heard some words that should not have been heard. They were, oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it seems like yeah, it seems like a very hostile work environment for them because once it gets on Twitter, then it's over, right? Like then you have no control over any narrative that is going on. It's just right at like, the end of the day, that, doesn't it come down to your ethics, like which has been eroding from the while? Now, once you decide that my job is to maximize visits, then Really, like if Shams doesn't do it, if Boz doesn't do it, I'm sure somebody else will be like, "Okay, if they're not doing it, I'll do it." Yeah, no, that's and that's a big problem. It's 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 and that's and this is and this is not a problem that is just unique to the NBA. Let's just make that mm-hmm. clear. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, ra- absolutely. the race to first is now everywhere, and it doesn't matter if you're covering the NBA or you're covering local news or you're covering politi- national politics. You know, tr- tr- it seems to me that Twitter is now is now sort of the the news feed. For a mm. lot of people, and with with Twitter, unfortunately, there is no room. There's little room for nuance. There's little room for context. No room for there's nuance. Li- yeah. yeah, there's no room for for deep reporting. It's just yeah. scandal in Boston. And then the problem with the problem with that is, as as you mentioned, Ashwin, is that now everyone is gonna is gonna be playing is gonna be playing predictor, and they're gonna be yeah. they're gonna be playing. Oh well, who could it be? What could the news be? Oh, and a, 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 an affair. Well, who is with a Boston staffer? Click, 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 and and then and then unfortunately, everyone gets dragged into that. And pretty much any yeah. fe- Boston female staffer is going to be embroiled in that against their will. They didn't ask to be involved in this. So, as much as I love Twitter for for news and for barbs and for jokes, and mm-hmm. it's also a really good networking site. Believe it or not, it is. There I is this validate yeah. that. I mean, we got you here through Twitter. Yeah, exactly. There is a real problem when you approach a delicate news topic like mm. it's a new, like it ha- in like it's a trade rumor, like it's a free agent signing. Where oh, I got this piece of information, I got to put it up. There, there has to be there. There are some topics where you need that require that require deeper reporting that require deeper thinking and mm-hmm. i think you're I th- I, this is not going to be the first example of that and it's not going to be the last so yeah. that's kind of how I, I i i i think of it it's just um there need there needs to be um we all need we all need to do better with that that makes sense i mean i i don't think apart from trade we even thought that something like this could be reported this way also i, I don't mm-hmm. think uh, yeah, like you know, we we didn't even know that this was possible. So once it no. happens, we're like, oh, huh, that's, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Weird. Like the, that's the thing. You, Twitter, social media, is a very young, is a very is very young, and I think and reporters are are coming for, are, have very, a lot of reporters you know, are come are are trying to bring their ideas into this very fast moving medium, and there's gonna there's gonna there's gonna be problems. You know, you're you're trying. I think a lot, a lot of a lot of reporters, and I'm among them. A lot of journalists, they're learning how to use these things day to day, and they're learning how to report on Twitter day to day. And there's also a change in how there's also a change um, social in society in terms of victims' rights, in terms of of how we approach race and and sex and all these other things. So. It's very, very, very hard to do something one way, right? Mm-hmm. When everything else around you is changing. Yeah. So it, it's so it's just to watch this unfold has been by equal turns compelling, horrifying, um, 
you know, and, and intriguing because you're kind of seeing how you're kind of seeing how the how how the reporting of news is change is changing or will have to change in real time. Um, and it's it's just it's extremely messy. We'll move on to a little bit lighter topics. Uh, please, <laughs> yes, no. please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you talk Robert about Sauer. it a bit, but <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the same week, the same week, both these things happen. That's the, I know. It's <laughs> it's 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 crazy. I I, I, I you know it's um it's 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 insane. I, I was gonna I was gonna pitch you a conspiracy theory, Pete, about the Knicks. I've pitched this to another Knicks fan, uh, and okay. he does not agree with me. But I thought I'll pitch it to you, <laughs> former Knicks fan. So my conspiracy theory is that okay. uh, the owner of of New York Knicks is not actually stupid. He's really smart because he understands okay. it's very difficult to win consistently. And, mm-hmm. you know, people galvanize, fans galvanize either when like something amazing is happening or something really bad is happening. Like it's like the, the prisoner mentality, oh, you know? Oh, okay. okay. So he he's really smart where he's just like, okay, it, it would take too much effort for me to like galvanize people <laughs> all the time to like have win championships or so let me just make extremely bad moves so that the fans just galvanize they hate me they all have like a like one person to hate and they all come together and they buy merch and they come and watch shows and they talk about the new york next what do you think about that's, that is that your theory or your friend's theory no that's my theory because Ooh, it's impossible that, to be that bad if you're the new, if you're like one of the best places to play basketball in. Like I understand the that, Sacramento that, Kings being bad because no one really wants to go play in Sacramento. Sacramento's a nice city. I've been to Sacramento. Um, oh come on, a, come on. That's a, that's an interest. That's a really really interesting theory. I look. I mean, the Knicks are the Knicks are valued at what? Three, they're the, two, they're still the, I think they're still the second l- most valued Five, the, the after most the Lakers. Valuable yeah. Matches. So, I mean, yeah, look, I think Lakers is number one, right? No, no, no. Lakers are number two. Yeah. Look, I mean, it, I, look, I don't think you can't be, you can't be an idiot and have a team that is, you know, the second, second, the second most valuable team in one of the, one of the biggest businesses, sports businesses in the world. So I mean, you must be doing some. You must be doing something right. Um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think there is something to be said for if you just stand pat and you're making money. You know, there there if there's little incentive little incentive to change, why change? Yeah. Um, I get what bothers me is to, is if you're a fan and you're tired of this, leave. Like don't you don't there's no there, last time I checked there's no contractual obligation. Between a fan and a team, James Dolan can run the team however he wants, and I may not agree with it. And in fact, I don't agree with it. And if I don't agree with it, it's it's my right as a fan to say, "What well, you know? What it's been real. I'm going to go." And I, I think I, I wish a lot of other fans felt the same way. I mean, there there is life is too short to subject yourself to misery. Never mind eight months of misery. When you're paying for tickets and you're buying the merch and you're 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 watching the games on TV, like that's time that and time is money. To me, like James Dolan, to, he can do whatever he wants. To me, if 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 the fans are the ones that are aggravated, leave. Yeah, and, and don't give me this whole thing about like oh it's a tradition. It, leave. It's it's you know it's it's very simple. I mean, look, there, the there's a Brooklyn there's a team in another borough. That you can that you can root for if you're so inclined. It's right there. Yeah. It's and there there it's in a nifty new arena and they've got they've got pretty good uniforms and a really good and a, and <laughs> ownership that seems to care. Go there. You know? Live liven up that liven up that fan base. That 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 to me is um that to me that to me is is an easy transition. Very easy. Fair enough. Fair enough. That, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's a it's a look, it's a good it's you can solve I've all heard, the world's problems is is if you don't like it, just leave. <laughs> look, I, I I don't know. Look, I I never understood the the fandom where you have to suffer. But what would twenty one year old Pete say to this? The hardcore fan. 
he would probably he would probably tell me to to get lost and get a haircut. That's probably what he would tell me <laughs> to do. Like he, probably, I mean, but I don't know. When you get older, again, like as I get older, I realize that I have I, I'm realizing now that I have less time. I don't have as much time to waste. I don't have as much time to 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 fritter on things that um, that aggravate me or that don't um, that don't concern me. So. I, you know, I made a, I made a very conscious decision to just not invest my time and energy and money in a product that I don't, I don't, I don't care about. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not going to prescribe my way of living to anyone else, but it's worked for me. Like I'm happier, I'm healthier. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not yelling at the television. It's great. It's great. Oh, that's I great. That's that. great. I love the Knicks fans. The Knicks fans are really passionate, though. I give them that. And, 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 and the thing that I love the most is, is is with Knicks fans is just like the optimism too. Like, oh, we're gonna get Donovan Mitchell. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not gonna get Donovan Mitchell. Like, do you and do you want and do you want Donovan Mitchell when you don't have a decent point guard? Like, I I don't you know. Yeah, I look. I I I love Knicks fans. I I I, 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 I can see you. Them. Like, I can see like the. The frustration, the, the emotions, just like coming back from you know past memories, just on your face. It's like, oh I, my god! I, I've been, I've, I've seen this movie before. I've sat through this play many, many times. Okay, I tried to get excited for Raymond Felton. I tried to get excited for <laughs> for, for Carmelo Anthony holding onto the ball on the wing, you know, and then jacking up an eighteen footer. I, I've been through this play. And I, I, I know how frustrating it is, and I, you know, out. I, 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 don't, I don't know why anyone else would want to go through it, but hey, you know what? It takes all kinds. If, if that makes you happy, if that, make, if that makes you, if you feel invested that way, great. <laughs> and how did you, like, go from, I mean, Ashun, do you have something, like, can I ask a question? Is it okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, I'd as like long as it's not about the Knicks, because I, I don't no. want him to leave the podcast in the middle. And yeah, it just seems like okay. So so uh, so I'm always interested in like the business around the NBA. So like yeah. you you have created a career around the NBA, writing about the NBA, writing books. Mm-hmm. How did yeah. you kind of like navigate yourself to like all right, I'm going to write books and make my money uh, that way. Like how, well, that, how did that, you get there? How yeah. did you get there? Well, that presupposes that I'm making money off of this. Um, <laughs> no, but that's a, that's a again. The, you guys are asking really good questions. Um, no, I mean that was something that was some. It was something I, I kind of did on the side. You know, I, I started. I got ver- I got lucky, I think, but I also just consciously sort of started to, started to. Let me go back. That's a really good question. I want to give it a thoughtful answer, which yes. you guys deserve. Um, I was, I was for a long time. I was, I was a full time writer, um, you know, for for trade magazines, for newspapers, and I wasn't really enjoying the writing. So when I started to freelance in two thousand six, I made a conscious decision. Like, look, I'm going to try and find, write about things that I like, because I'm. I'm in business for myself now. I want to do things that I enjoy because why would I? Why? Why? Why am I doing this if I'm not doing things that I enjoy? Why am I spending my time? Why am I spending my time independent? Yeah. So I decided to. I decided I would start to. I would decide to. Start, I would start writing about sports, and I did it in a way that was very, very. I think strategic in that I decided to focus on things that really weren't being written about. So I went, so with slam, I started pitching the slam and I pitched, I pitched writing profiles about players that were retired. And when I, when I wrote for Rolling Stone, it was about this, it was about, you know, Salem sportswear, this really cool, um, you know, apparel company that started personalized NBA players on t-shirts and sweatshirts. So I wanted to. I made it a conscious decision that I, I wasn't really going to be a hot take guy. I wasn't going to be, you know, writing a, 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 a blog, a team about a blog, because a lot of other people were doing that. I wanted to focus on writing about things that maybe really weren't being reported as much or on angles that required more reporting. Because, look, anybody can start, and this is no offense to you guys, anybody can start a podcast. 
Oh. Anybody can. Offense taken. <laughs> anybody can do a. <laughs> anybody can write a blog about a team or about a player, but to to go out and to like call people and to yeah. try and get more in depth, like that takes a little bit of work, and not everyone is willing to do that work. So I made a conscious effort to say, look, I'm going to try and focus on things that uh, I'm going I'm to focus on on articles and on topics that I haven't really found it. I've really, really read anything about, but that I would be interested in. So, okay. and I wanted to find out more about the past. I wanted to find out more about how things got to be where they were. So I wrote about, as I said before, Salem Sports, which ties into, you know, the NBA's apparel and marketing efforts from your, and I, ta- I, I talked about, I wrote about the slam dunk contest and the, and the old timers game. And, um, you know, about, about these old, about older things, things that I was curious about. And then after I built that sort of um, a repository of articles about the NBA's past and it's and the things that were overlooked, I decided to parlay that into a book. And you know, it, it kind of it, it kind of worked its way out way out way organically, but it took a long ass time. Like the first NBA article I wrote was about Marvin Gaye's national anthem at the All Star Game in 1983 for Grant. Oh. And that was like in 2013, and I got the book deal in 2018. So after that point, I thought, okay, you know, so it was really the Marvin Gaye story that got me thinking about the NBA in a different way because that anthem really launched the NBA in a different direction, if you think about it. It launched the NBA as a distinctly black sport, and we're gonna, and they were going to market to that audience. So after that, I tried to find... I thought there was I thought there was a book there, so I began to report on things that were connected to that event that I could turn into a book. Oh, a book that would explain okay. how the NBA got to be from like a middle America white sport trying to market to mm-hmm. that to that to the same demographics as baseball and football to the sport that it is now. So it was a very conscious effort, and but it took a long time to get there because you know again I was. You know, I'm I'm a guy who just likes to write and likes basketball. And to get to a point where I could write a book about it took a long time. It took took five years. Wow. I had no idea the Marvin Gaye uh, National Anthem rendition was, like, you know, viewed in this manner at all. I mean, that was, like I said, yeah. great performance, but I didn't. Yeah. That was, oh, that to me was the, that was to me was the impetus for it. That, uh, the impetus of the, the impetus for the book was the Marvin Gaye piece. If you and your, if you and your listeners go back and read that article, like, there's a lot of stuff that was that was left on the cutting room floor. And there was enough that made me think there's a book here because the NBA before that anthem was very different from the NBA after that anthem. And if you look at everything after 1983, right, mm-hmm. when, when Marvin performs that anthem, it's a totally different NBA. Yeah, and David Stern becomes commissioner and then... Yep, just, Jordan oh, comes. Wow. There's, a, oh, there's, wow. a whole, there's a whole marketing style cultural shift that happens after that anthem. So really, getting wow. the chance to write to write that write that article, um, and thanks to Sarah Larimer or Grantland, if, formerly of Grantland, if she's listening to it to this, um, of course, she was <laughs> she was she was the she she allowed me to write that article, and that article helped me write more about the NBA and about things that weren't so transparent about the NBA. So there you go. Wow. Do you think in ten years we'll write something about Fergie's national anthem and how it has like? <laughs> oh, I, I don't, dude, I don't have the strength for that. I, 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 I don't, I don't have the mental capacity or the energy to write about that anthem. I, I, I just don't. Um, nobody should. It's, it's like drinking. She, pain, she, she tried guess. some Marvin Gaye there. I think she tried some Marvin Gaye there. Oh, I don't know what she was trying, but it wasn't. It, it was, it was bad. It was. I don't know what that was. Maybe she was just I having mean, a bad day. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I think I think she you know, I think she was trying to do she was trying to put her own spin on it, which is great, but it was a spin that nobody asked for. Um, <laughs> but look, you know, more power to her. Tr- <laughs> I don't know what she was doing with the trilling and the yeah, it was it was it was no good. But hey. We're still talking uh, about it now. Yeah, but uh, Pete, you you talked about, you know, we 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 talked about your book and then we got distracted by uh, Sauber and uh, conspiracy theories. But let me bring it back. 
you said that you're covering the NBA from 1975 to 89. So almost mm-hmm. like apart from four years, it's Kareem's life basically. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, history. Yeah. Uh, from hang time to prime time, business entertainment and the birth of the modern NBA. Tell us, you know, if you could tell us how awesome Kareem was. Time, but <laughs> no, that means Gordon Lynn. No, 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 no. Ashton finish. Ashton finish. Yeah. Uh, you know, how would you decided on this? And probably like your like the number one learning that you had from this. I mean, revenue wise, I'm sure it, there's a lot of learnings, but something that you probably did not expect to see because for us, this joy of discovery is a great feeling. Uh, yeah. You might yeah. be doing something and then out of that, suddenly you're like, oh, but uh, 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 that feeling, yeah. did you ever have that feeling while doing your research for the book? Oh, How yeah. you uh, I mean, decided to research for the book? Yeah, I mean, every day when I was re- reporting and researching this book, there was I, was, I learned something new every day. And there was in and every pretty much every person I spoke to, I, I, I learned something. Um, the reason why I wrote this book was I felt that there wasn't any book like like this one. I didn't mm-hmm. th- I didn't think there was a book that explained how the NBA got to be the NBA in big capital letters and neon lights. You know, there there in there are a lot of great books that you know there are a lot of great books about certain teams from that era, players from that era. But there was no book that I that I, I encountered, and I, I'm a basketball book junkie. There was no book that I read that explained how the NBA got from point A to point B. Meaning, you know, the NBA. You know, I always read, oh, the NBA had drug problems, and it was too black, and it was too this, and then Bird came along, and Magic, and Dr. J, and David Stern, and Jordan, and that was it. I, I never really read a book that explained in totality how that happened. And mm-hmm. I wanted to write that book. And, you know, and that was the thing. Writing this book was, was every day I learned something. But the one thing that I, I, I think the one thing that I came across um, in reporting it was that the NBA was more than just Bird, Magic, Dr. J, Michael, and David Stern. There are a, there, there is a vast cast of characters um, who work behind the scenes tirelessly to make the NBA into, into what it was, into this into this international business and sports juggernaut. So that was the one thing that I learned was that the that this book that this the NBA's success come yeah it, it, yeah the the five or six people that I mentioned yes they are the the stars of that show and rightfully yeah. so, but there mm-hmm. is a a giant cast of characters who made the NBA great and who made the NBA into what it is. Um, and that's what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted to shed light on on the people that made made the NBA, that turned the NBA into the business that it is. Folks like Kay Koplovitz, who you know kind of turned the NBA, who got the NBA on cable, or Bill Thicket, who did marvels with with merchandise, and Bill Marshall, who was at the NBA, who was at the NBA's uh, merchandise arm for years, or Ted Shaker at CBS Sports. All of these men and women, dozens and dozens of them turn the NBA into what we know and love today, which is this, you know, evolutionary, cutting edge, um, big glittery um, spectacle that it is. And that's that's the one thing I want to do with this book is to is to highlight those people who who played a role okay. in that evolution. Uh, why 75 to 89 and why prime and, uh, you know, uh, hang time to prime time? Like, I, I guess hang time to prime time makes sense. But why 75 yeah. to 89? Well, seventy five is well, seventy five is when Larry O'Brien became the NBA's commissioner, and that was the turning point because and because that meant that the NBA was was in business. That meant it was serious because Larry O'Brien, you know, he was not an NBA guy. He wasn't like a PR person, like who who came from like the team ranks and worked worked his worked his way up. Larry O'Brien was a major player in American politics. You know, he was JF, he was John F. Kennedy's right hand man for years as JFK oh. became president. Um, you know, he was he was on uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's cabinet. He was a major player in Democratic uh, national politics. So when Larry O'Brien becomes commissioner in 1975, that is a huge, huge deal for the NBA. A huge deal because yeah. it, it, it gives them legitimacy. It gives them credence. In Y89, that's when the NBA got its first big um, television deal with, with uh, NBC Sports. 
that was you know they were no they were a major player now where they were going to be on prime time they were going to have games on multiple times a week they were going to be marketed properly they were going to be part of an entertainment package um, because um, Dick Ebersol, who was the president of NBC Sports, recognized that the NBA that, that the NBA was a television series like ER or Seinfeld or any great show where there were characters and story arcs. And David Stern w- wanted that more than anything. So really, that seventy five to eighty nine was the, to me the perfect time frame for that. It's really the la- the NBA's last quote unquote innocent age where it wasn't this this big property that we see now and as for the title of the book you know it's something that i worked on with my with my editors where you know we just spitball titles and i said oh how about from hang time to prime time and my my um my editor said okay great <laughs> and that was it it's it's really it's really nothing more it's nothing it's 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 just that it's just that simple i wish i could tell you guys like oh we did focus groups and we did this no it's just it was just exchange of emails but, um, but on what cup of coffee did this answer come like what was your first one? uh no i think it, uh, it was in the afternoon so i'm a two cup i'm a two cup guy in the morning so that's what that's when it was it was it was it was i was well i was well past my coffee intake for the day when that happened. Do you remember some of the other names probably that you had for this? The original name for this book was, um, was it's fantastic, which is a, pl- which it's is uh, kind of an homage to the NBA's, um, uh, marketing campaign in the eighties. It was called it's oh. fantastic. How I think it was how Marvin's Anthem, MJ shoes and David Stern's vision ignited the NBA. Something like that it was a very long, cumbersome title <laughs> so that was the original title um and it, it for some reason it just it didn't it didn't hold water so that's how <laughs> the the new title came to be yeah i mean it's a good name i think that the, i think that the, the names that you guys chose was much better than the names you did no. choose oh thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> hang time to prime time hang time to yeah, prime time it, 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 it rolls up the tongue pretty well and it's it kind of invo- evokes what the book is about and I don't know. I mean, look. I mean, I. I'll be honest with you guys. I'm just happy that the, the book is out there and it's being read, and I'm still talking about it. I mean, it's 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 that to me is is really what matters most at the end of the day is is being able to to chat with folks like you and you know and 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 just you know have a good time and 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 sell some books and you know be able to maybe but, if but I'm, you, if did I'm you, did you enjoy the morning. entire experience of writing the book and researching it? Do you think? You oh God, book? yeah. Okay. Oh God, yeah, I loved it. Look, I mean, look, <laughs> it wasn't too long ago that I was getting paid ten dollars a pop to write movie synopses for a, for an app. You know, I, it wasn't too long ago that I was, um, you know, that I, I I couldn't, you know, make the cut writing um, copy for uh, for a law uh, for a legal office. So like, mm-hmm. this is, I mean, this is a dream. Okay, come that's true. great. That's I, great. I, I loved every minute of it. Loved it. Okay. I, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. And if someone, and if, and I, and I, I hope to do it again. And if I don't look, I mean, this is, this is the experience of a lifetime. And, you know, I can, I can, in all seriousness, I can look my daughter in the eye and say, look, you know, dreams come true. And if you want to do something, you can do it if you, if you put your mind to it. So, yeah. And I can, I can offer her proof of that. I can, it's not just me talking, talking nonsense. Nice. That's, 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 a, that's a good, good way to sum it all up about the book experience yeah yeah i mean we've always wondered what the the amount of relief that you must feel and then i'm sure there are times when there's a lot of anxiety oh my god am i I, I, there must be writer's block i don't know whether you uh, you've got probably the right title must be so much tension through the way but when it finally comes out uh, do you have a copy uh, with you can you like uh like yeah you want to see a copy uh maybe yeah yeah yeah, sure sure sure. yeah Whoa, it's a, it's a, it's a fat book. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, you can see, you know, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, no, it's a legit book. I mean, it's a legit, you know, actually, you know, I put, I put the homework into it. Yeah. And as, as for like, as for the anxiety, no, because look, I mean, I'm, I don't know about other writers. I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak for other writers, but mm-hmm. like, this is my job. Like, this is how I pay, this is how I pay bills. This is how I, you know, support my family. So I don't really, I don't really have a lot of anxiety because if I don't write, I don't get paid. 
So to me, you know, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, look, there are days that are easier than others. Um, and, um, you know, that's just how it goes, but that's any job, you know, if, if you were, if you were, I don't care if you're working at a law firm or at a, at a, at a grocery store, like you have to go to work and unless you're Kyrie Irving. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can have bad and you can have, you can have bad days, but you still have to work. And it's the same thing with writing. You have to just, you know, okay. So maybe one day you write 300 words instead of a thousand. But you still have to work. You still have to put the effort in. And eventually, like, and the one thing I've learned, too, is that it, it, if you work at something long enough as a writer, it'll come together. And mm-hmm. if it doesn't, you start over and you, 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 you build it. You build again. It, it, it's, yeah, I, I don't really subscribe to writer's block or anxiety because, again, like, this, is, this is a job. It's a job that I love. And it's a job that I adore. And I, I'm, I'm grateful every day that I get to do this. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, I, I should not be, you know... The fact that I'm not digging ditches or or doing a job that requires me to, you know, um, do physical requ- that, labor. That, yeah, I mean, it's 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 it is it is a it's a it's a miracle. So I don't take that for granted. And you know, my dad was a contractor for years, and I saw him get up every day at four thirty five, get out the get out the door, do his work. My mom the same thing. My mom worked for a bank. She would, you know, that was a she spent a majority of her career of her, of her life doing that or career doing that. So for me to be like, well, I can't write today because, oh, the muse hasn't come yet. That, you know, I, I, that doesn't hold water. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, what I do is a job and, you know, and I, I, I'm very, very lucky to be doing this and I don't take that for granted. Awesome. awesome. Great. great. Uh, we will leave you off with a few, few sort of questions so that, you know, you, you don't have NBA to questions. think of it much. NBA okay. questions. <laughs> all right, I'll do, my uh, your, I'll do my best. Your all-time starting five, all-time. All-time, all-time starting five. Oh boy, uh, let's see. Kareem at center. Uh, give me Magic and Michael at the guards. Give me Bill Russell at the power forward. At the small forward. Give me LeBron. Nice. Perfect. Pretty strong team. Pretty strong. Uh, <laughs> not, not bad. Not, not, bad. not a bad starting five. Uh, your your dark horse for this upcoming 2022-23 season. Who some something in the uh, you know in the off season that you think that oh they have taken a step up. Oh man, I I think the Ca- I think the Cavaliers are going to make the Eastern Conference Finals. That that's oh. my dark horse. Just out, out of my butt prediction. Um, I, I they were a good team last year. They were a really strong core. They have a really great coach um, in Bickerstaff, I believe. So, like, they're 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 going to be and Annie Mitchell is just like icing on icing on the cake. I think they're going to make the what the Eastern Conference Finals. And your favorite 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 player right now is Joel Embiid because I think I, I like him as a I like his personality. I, I like the fact that he's very much like of the people or tries to be, um, and I love his game. Uh, I mean, again, a, a guy that big shouldn't do the things that he does like it, it, it i mean shooting from three it's i i i love watching it. you said shooting from three big guy and then you pick joel and beat instead of your <laughs> joker and it's like come on man look i'm i i still have i still have a little soft spot for the for the sixers um okay that's why right. uh, right. so a little, a little soft spot it, it's you know I, i'm not made out it's of it's close stone. enough but joe but yeah. joker joker is great i think i think Embiid wins the mvp this year um, that's sort of just my like sense, but mm-hmm. yeah, I'm an, I'm an Embiid guy. Okay. Your, your favorite and the person who you interviewed for the book, your most favorite person who probably told you something like, you know, which oh, man. you did not see, expect. See everyone. I think you guys are expecting me to talk like say George Gervin or Dan Issel or Julius Irving and they were all great, but like the inevitably the best people I spoke to, the people that were just had the, the best stories were just old NBA employees or old team employees. Like, you know, there's a woman, um, oh man, I'm trying to think. Like, I, I spoke to so many people, just regular folks that were just amazing. Like, just mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. Like, Gary Way, of Nike, for, who formerly of Nike, was great. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, just, just so many, there's just so many people like that who were just outstanding. But I'm trying to think, the one person who just like blew me away, oh man. 
That's a good question. Yeah, there, 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 there's, there's too many. But the one, but I'll tell you what, the, the, the player, okay, the player mm-hmm. who was the best interview that I, that I did, was probably George Gervin. Oh, nice. He was just the Ice Man. Yeah, he was hilarious. He was candid. Um, just. Did you tell him? Did yeah. you say how much he hated Michael Jordan? <laughs> we didn't get into that. <laughs> um, though I, I, though I, I might text him and ask him uh, how he feel, how he felt. Um, wow. But no, but he <laughs> That's was. That's a major flex. <laughs> he, he was great. <laughs> He was. No, I, I don't mean that. I don't mean that as a uh, as a flex. I'm just saying. Hey, you can flex. You can flex. No, nah, I'm not a flexer. That's that's why you know that's that. We, no, we, to, we I, talked to Robert Ory seven years ago. We're still talking about it. There you go. Yeah, you you got you got to gotta stay hungry, guys. You know how it goes. <laughs> gotta stay humble. Yeah, man. Uh, stay humble. That's true. You, you know, right now there's it's, it's a documentary season, right? Like we've got a documentary. Oh my! Like, it's, it's not. Wait, wait, wait. I, 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 no, it's not a. First of all, all these are not documentaries. They're like entertainment. They're like entertainment. The, the, the Tim Donahue thing is just, I mean, really bad. Sorry, I, mean, I just, I mean, I just I feel mean, like there's I, too much documentaries that are not like they're more point of views than documentaries. My my question yeah. was, Pete, if there's a yeah. documentary that you wanted to have made, because you know, like uh, a, oh, that a I story have which, made? yes, that a story that I mean, has not been told, and you are like, oh, this is a really interesting story. Maybe well, it doesn't I mean, have the masala, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can't do prime time. I mean, come on, look, it's out Netflix, there. Netflix, let's let, let pick it up. Let's get come it on, done. Hulu, it Netflix. Done. Come on, you can you can interview me. You can have my pasty white mug on. You can interview, uh, <laughs> you know, George Gervin, who's number George Gervin, Julius. They're all there. They're all live. Yeah, I mean that. I mean, to me, this is tailor made for a, you know, a, a, a two hour doc, a tight two hour doc. Or if you want to go sprawling, go five part. Hey, I'm not gonna complain. Five part. <laughs> nice. Hey, it's a it's a long time. Fifteen. It's fifteen years, man. That's a long time. Hey, man. Why not? Yeah. Absolutely. Why not? I mean, they they made like an eight part documentary of one year of Michael Jordan. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> they also, and they're and they're making a four part documentary of of uh, Carmelo Anthony. Carmelo so. Anthony. Oh my um, God. <laughs> so. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's it's right oh. here. The book is right, right here. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I, I I I'll I'll hear any offer. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you those offers and we'll take uh, six percent uh, finder's fee or whatever the finder's fee is right now uh, now we, we, we do this thing with all the guests you know it's a this or that question so we'll give you two options whichever you know you feel like just go for it okay, okay? Uh, Kobe right. or Duncan Duncan oh, oh. yes <laughs> in uh, right now. Like, I'm, I'm going to buy a book tonight just today uh, the book is being bought Good. I, I, need, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> uh, 80s NBA or the 2010s? This, this NBA. 2020 or 2020? Uh, like this. So, eight, so 80s, 80s NBA or this NBA? Yeah. Oh, boy. You know, 80s NBA? And here's why. Because I, I came to basketball NBA late. So I want to see mm-hmm. what, what it was like. <laughs> Pete, favorite basketball movie? Hoosiers. Uh, Carmelo Anthony or Bernard King? Like the oh, bigger Bernard New York King. legend. Bernard King. What if I replace Melo with the Linsanity? Linsanity or BK? Linsanity. Oh, come on. Oh, Linsanity, Linsanity really? Linsan- <laughs> Linsanity. Oh, over, my God. Linsanity over Carmelo. BK over, over Carmelo. Bernard King to me but is, is... Linsanity over BK. Oh, then Bernard, Bernard King over Linsanity. Oh, okay. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Bernard King to me is just... is. He had such a, a a wonderful two to three year stretch where he was unstoppable, and to have mm-hmm. his career and the, or his career get deterred the way that it did is just is a crying shame. Like he, he he had so much more ahead of him, and it just we never really got a chance to see him continue his peak. So BK all the way. Okay, uh, Magic or Bird. <sighs> Man, this is hard. Um, uh, bird. Got to go with bird. bird. Uh, Larry O'Brien or David Stern? David Stern. No doubt. Yeah, I love I love Larry. What he did for the game was tremendous, but it's 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 David Stern because David Stern, as you read in the book, was very much um, Larry O'Brien's consigliere for for. A number of years. Everything. 
Yeah. yeah. So David, yeah, as, as a source told me, um, you know, David, uh, you know, David Stern was the puppet master uh, for a lot of Larry O'Brien's time there. So it's David Stern. Good man. Uh, beautiful. That, that's it. That's it, uh, Pete, man. Thank you so much for joining us on this pod. Uh, you've been our first guest in a while. We've been trying to think, uh, we've been going with the thing that, you know, we'll just do it ourselves and see. But it's so much more fun to have a guest, especially someone, you know, who's uh, done so much work on it and taught us so many things. I mean, that uh, the 75, the 89 deal, uh, 83 national anthem, and like so many new names that we've heard that we probably, you know, we probably need to do a little bit more reading with your book. Hopefully, and well, then. I was gonna, I was gonna say, like, wait, wait, let, yeah. let me take a photo. Why don't you hold up the book? I'll take a uh-huh. photo. You, you're coming. Oh, 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 yes. Beautiful. All right, Ashwin. All right, got it. Beautiful. I was gonna say, like, to me, this book is to me. If you're if you're a current NBA fan, and you want to understand how the league came to be, this is the book. Yep, that's the book. I can't think of I can't think of a better way to describe it. It's just if you want to understand how the NBA got to be where it is now, the NBA that you enjoy and that's enjoyed around the world, literally mm-hmm. as I'm talking to two, two uh, international denizens, read my book. Awesome. Absolutely. That's that's the promo right there. There you go. <laughs> Intro. <laughs> Ashwin. Got it. Cut it Edit, out. Editor in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, but uh, thanks you. Thank you once again. You you took time thanks, from your busy schedule. We had a little bit of schedule conflict, but uh, you know you had patience and you got it all done. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, if everyone else, you know, like, share, subscribe, do all the jazz, and we will catch you for the next episode. Vinit, say bye. Bye.